Já vi que a galera tá lotou aqui, muito bem, obrigado a todos. Só último aviso, depois não falo mais nesse assunto, tá certo? Se você, né, a palestra vai ser em inglês, se você precisar do radinho de tradução, lá naquela, naquela cabine preta lá no fundo. Ah não, tá dizendo que acabou o radinho de tradução, é isso? Beleza, então na verdade se você precisar de tradução, pega o cara do lado e ouve no radinho dele, porque não tem mais radinho de tradução, ok? Tá certo? Estamos prontos para começar? Ok. Então, pessoal, eu queria é, pedir uma salva de palmas para Rick Falk, uh, Rick Falk Winkler, que é, uh, da Suécia. Ele, em 2006, fundou um partido na Suécia com três pautas principais. Reformar as leis de copyright, abolir o sistema de patentes e defender o direito à privacidade online. Nos primeiros dois dias após o seu lançamento, o site oficial da iniciativa teve mais de 3 milhões de acessos. Seis anos depois, o Partido Pirata já conseguiu cadeiras no Parlamento Europeu deputados em diversas cidades na Alemanha e já está presente em mais de 30 países, inclusive no Brasil, mostrando o quanto essas questões são importantes no século XXI. Essa será a primeira vez que o Rick, o pirata, virá ao Brasil, né? a primeira vez que está no Brasil, ele vem falar do seu movimento e da sua agenda. Então, com vocês, Rick Falkwinger. So, Rick, uh, you're here, everyone is waiting for you to talk about the Pirate Party, but uh, I hear from, your, from your, your, your slides, it looks like you're going to talk about much more, right? Well, I'm hoping that people here will feel inspired to change the world for the better. Everybody can do it, and I think we share a lot of the same values in terms of how the, we can make a better world by sharing. So thank you very much, and it's your show. Thanks. Thank you, Bruno. <sighs> wow, there's certainly a lot of you here. So, hi. I'm Rick, and... I'm sorry, this, this was kind of harder than I expected, really. There's so many of you. I'm just, I'm just going to say it, aren't I? <sighs> Hi, I'm Rick. I'm a politician. I was a happy coder once. Now look at me. This just, I thought I could start talking politics about net liberty on Friday nights and Saturday nights with friends over a glass of beer. Then, before I knew it, I was starting poli start talking politics and liberties over coffee at work, with friends, over family dinners, and it gradually took over my life. I went from a happy coder in jeans and t-shirt, now look at me. And before I knew it, I had started a political party that was a global movement that has now spread to over 50 countries and put about 50 people in parliaments. It can happen to anybody in this room. You're happy coders now. This is what you can happen to you if you start talking politics. So before I move on, is there anybody in this room who does not understand English. And not a single hand went up. I love that. That oh, never anybody who doesn't understand English when I ask in English. I love that. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk a bit about how we are changing the world just by refusing to understand that it's impossible. And I'm Falkvinge, my last name on Twitter. I really like seeing when people like what I'm talking about, don't like what I'm talking about, or don't even listen to what, what I'm saying. So keep, keep commenting on this presentation throughout it. Falkvinge. Scandinavian name. So, introductions. How many in here have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party before? Let's see a show of hands. 
that's some, I'd say about half, which is fairly consistent across the world actually. No matter where on the planet I present, about half to two thirds have heard of the Swedish Pirate Party before. It's so common I actually put it in the presentation and I show this presenta that part in every piece of the world. So just for kicks, how many in here have heard of any other Swedish political party before? Let's see a show of hands. I don't see a single hand, so I was wrong about that one. It's usually at least one or two hands that go up. So, for those of you who have not heard about us before, we love the net, we love copying and sharing, and we love civil liberties. For that, the, some people, and in particular the copyright industry, call us pirates. Probably in trying to make us feel some kind of shame about what we love, but that didn't work. We decided to stand tall about it instead. So now we've put many people in parliaments, two people in the European Parliament in 2009, some 50 people in states parliaments in Germany, about 200 people in local councils across Europe, and we now exist in 56 countries. Getting each, getting more and more successes in every new election. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why we do that and how you can change the world as well. We started in Sweden as Pirat Partiet. Oh, and here comes the sign of the Partido de Pirata do Brasil, and there it went down again. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I'm going to talk about 10 minutes each about politics and policies of protest. A lot of people talk about this as being some sort of illegitimate protest movement. Talk going a little bit about copyright regime versus civil liberties. What's the stake here anyway? I'm going to talk about a little bit about how I, just how I pulled off this crazy stunt and end with the message that you can change the world. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So, politics. That's a really boring subject, isn't it? Like, really? <laughs> politics? Seriously? At campus party? And even worse, politics of protest. I mean, the Pirate Party is so often described as just being a protest party, as in, you're not legitimate, you're just out protesting, you're not happy about anything we do. Well, the thing is, it actually is, is protest. It's not pure defiance. So, the key, the key thing here is, not it's okay to not agree. Wanting to change the status quo is dissent by definition. And that's always okay. This has happened many times before. The Greens protested pollution, demanded industry regulation. That was 40 years ago. You had workers and the labor movement who protested exploitation of workers and demanded labor unions. That was 80 years ago. You had liberals who protested the overbearing powers and privileges of the crown and the church and demanded something obscure called individual citizens' rights. That was 120 years ago. This happens about every 40 years that somebody stands up and says it is time to reconquer democracy. Every generation has to reconquer democracy on its own because it is never given to them. So, let's take a look at the Greens again, 40 years ago. During the 1970s, I mean the Vietnam War era, hip, hippies and so on, the rallying crew, cries of the youth were peace and love. Usually accompanied by the odd joint for the correct tone of voice, right? Peace and love. That was a protest. That was a protest, quite a legitimate one. 
and it deepened into a deeper ideology of sustainability, which has many more syllables and, can, and where you cannot pronounce this at all after a joint or two, but it still became a political platform, which, which matured and survives in, in most parliaments today. But things have changed. Things have changed. Regularly, value surveys are done for 17-year-olds of the world. Sustainability has been on the top of their minds for the past 40 years. And so why is 17-year-olds, why are these people so important? They're being measured because it turns out that by the age of 17, the values you have chosen tend to stick with you for the rest of your life. So surveying 17-year-olds is one of the most powerful indicators of the coming changes to society for the decades to come. And something else is now on the top of 17-year-olds' minds. It's free speech and openness. Free speech and openness. Easier expressed as, leave the net alone. I mean, you've all, you've all seen it. You've seen governments all over the world cracking down on the net whenever something happens that they are unhappy with. About a year ago today, you had an ex-president, Mubarak, who decided that whenever people started protesting, he would just shut off the entire internet. I, I personally think that's kind of stupid, because if you want to keep people indoors, the last thing you want to do is shut off the internet. You should turn it up and crank it up. So, across the world, all governments, all governments are doing four things to the net and to the young generation, to the 17-year-olds of today. They're creating censorship, wiretapping, trackability, and identifiability. They're killing free speech. They're killing free speech. And they don't understand that they're doing this. If today's politicians understood that the laws they're making is the equivalent of putting a microphone under every cafe table, they would be horrified. But they don't live online like, they, like we do like the 17-year-olds do, so they don't understand what it is they're doing. There are some nice exceptions, but in general, this is what every government is doing, and only the excuses differ. Every government is using locally acceptable excuses for these four actions. In China, it's stability and morality of the nation. In some predominantly Muslim countries, it's sanctity of the prophet. In the West, it tends to be one of four things, or a combination of them. Terrorism, child pornography, file sharing, and organized crime. Any one of those four can be used to get any law through that cracks down on free speech, regardless of whether it's actually counterproductive to what they're trying to achieve. There are some excep exceptions. I'd like to particularly mention the Brazil Marco Civil, which arguably that isn't quite perfect. I mean, it introduces identifiability, retroactive identifiability, but it takes a very good stance that is, I'd say is unique in the world. It says that citizenship requires net access. This is unique in the world, absolutely unique. And the world is watching this initiative. It says that nobody can be cut off from the internet for any other reason than not paying your internet bill. This is unique in the world and very, very positive. It establishes net neutrality, which means that the big are, uh, has, have just as strong a voice as the small. I'll be returning to that. And it establishes messenger immunity, that the mailman is never responsible for the contents of the message, which is another very important thing that I'll be returning to again. <laughs> Meanwhile, elsewhere in the world, 
in Arizona, for instance, just not, not too far from here, you had a law against upsetting people online, which became criminal. And it was so broad that if I had landed in Arizona instead, I couldn't even... I mean, it was essentially law, law against trolling. I couldn't have gone online saying that on my trip here at the airport, I saw books for sale that were Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and Return of the King, as I logged on to my favorite fantasy forums and added with, and followed up with, The Lord of the Rings has become a book. And then lean back, bring out the popcorn, and just enjoy the show of angry shouts and confused people. And the, that Arizona law, that was illegal. So people genuinely do not, un, politicians do not understand what freedom of speech means. And it's up to us as activists and as citizens to explain that to them in the ways we can. What we're demanding isn't really rocket science, after all. It is that civil liberties should apply offline as well as online. And I'll get more into that in a couple of minutes. How many here remember Forever Young from Alphaville? Or know what it is? I'll see show of hands. Okay, most of you. That's good. I mean, it's... Forever Young is this beautiful ballad that arrived in the 80s, right, from Alphaville, where people would dance cheek to cheek on the last slow dance of the night, essentially before heading home with one another and screwing each other's brains out. It's beautiful. Have you taken time to listen to what's, what it's about? Have you heard the lyrics of this? The first four lines of Forever Young are Let's dance in style, let's dance for a while Heaven can wait, we're only watching the skies Hoping for the best, but expecting the worst Are you gonna drop the bomb or not? Forever Young, do you really want to live forever? This was published in 1984, which is kind of coincidental with the fact that the phrase that the world has become much more dangerous is being used as an excuse for more surveillance. More dangerous. People were dancing cheek to cheek about the end of the world. About nuclear war. I grew up in the 80s. I remember what that was like. Every night we went to bed, we weren't really sure there'd be a tomorrow. We, I'm sorry, my, my, my voice is breaking a bit. This is, these memories are quite hard. We weren't sure that the sun, we would see another sunrise. And if you didn't grow up in the 80s, I don't think you can really relate to the fear that we grew up with. We got something that I never, I don't think any of us who grew up in the 80s expected to get. We got our 40th birthday. So in this world, some politicians are now saying that the world has become a much more dangerous place, so we must have cameras and wiretapping and tracking they're using a very well established political method in doing this and just like every trade has its own language i mean a mathematician could use a language that a dentist would have absolutely no idea what they were talking about and a dentist could use language that a politician would have absolutely no idea what they were talking about. That just comes with being a professional. And this, this particular political method in parliamentary language, in 
the, the political language when claiming that the world has become more dangerous is known as lying like a filthy weasel. The world isn't more dangerous, but you can claim it is to get your, to get your surveillance through. Freedom of speech. Politicians get genuinely confused when we demand freedom of speech. As in, I don't understand what these people are rallying about. I don't, I don't understand these protests. We have freedom of speech. We've had freedom of speech for the last 120 years. I don't understand this. They must be delusional. Well, turns out that, yeah, we had freedom of speech offline. But you're now selling it to the highest corporate bidder. And we are quite upset about that. The net is an equalizer. I think it's absolutely amazing that a nine-year-old schoolgirl in Paraguay has the exact same strength of voice as me, a middle-aged male who happened to be born in the privileged parts of the world. And I think that is really unlocking potential for all of humanity. I think it's beautiful. But there are those who do not want to be equalized and therefore crack down on freedoms of speech. And that is why you're seeing rallies that the politicians do not understand. This is the map over the anti-actor protests in Europe that took place on February 4 and February 11 of this year. I think it's quite an impressive map, actually. And it took the European Parliament completely by surprise. Just dropped, kicked the entire agenda, which culminated with ACTA's firm rejection on July 4 this year. So there's another lesson for you. Protests work. Copyright regime versus civil liberties. Kind of the underlying theme here. If there's one thing we learn through history, one thing when looking at how powers have played out during centuries from the Middle Ages and onward, it is that powerful people use their power to keep their power. Keep their power. There, keep their power. This takes, the play, this takes many, many forms, but one of the most important ones are truth. Who controls what is true and what is false? If you have the ability to tell your fellow human beings what is true and what is false, there is nothing you can't do. Some people, when confronted with this opportunity, things in terms of being rich, eating good food, winning the lottery. If you had this privilege, you would not need money. You could be a living God among human beings walking on the planet. The ability to tell true from false is the greatest privilege anybody can ever hold. And that is why people fight, bleed, and die over it. When the printing press came in 1453, the Catholic Church held the privilege of telling, the tr telling truth from false. Preachers out in villages would explain what the world looked like. All of a sudden came the printing press. And somebody started printing Bibles in people's own language. They gave people the ability to verify sources. That led to 100 years of religious wars. And I'm kind of hoping we don't have to go through that all over again with the advent of the internet. But that's the scope of the conflict we're looking at. That is the scope. If you can challenge, if you can verify sources, you get into a position of power where you can challenge authority. 
And now the net has done more than that. It has given us the ability to broadcast our thoughts and ideas, to talk to the world, which is a yet more powerful position that is not welcome at all by those who previously held the privilege of telling true from false. Which is why you'll see this conflict just escalate and escalate and escalate. It isn't about free music. It is, something as, it is about something as big as what led to 100 years of bloody wars in all of Europe. It is about the privilege of telling truth from false. How many here would agree with the statement that sharing is good? Let's see a show of hands. That's pretty much everybody. So if I add the parameters that this might be a violation of the copyright monopoly, how many would still say that sharing is morally right? Let's see a show of hands. Still most people, not, as, not just as everybody, but still most people. That makes me happy. You'll notice that I said copyright monopoly. And that is an important point here. Copyright is not property. It is not moral. And it is not a natural right. When I buy a chair, I have the receipt right here. Actually, I don't. That was my campus party badge. But still, I have the receipt in hand. I own this chair. The receipt shows I've paid for it. This is, a, this is one copy out of a master drawing made at a plant somewhere. There are many chairs like it, but this one is mine. There are certain things I can do with this chair. I can take it apart and use it for new projects. Use the parts for new projects. I can put it out on the porch for neighbors to use if I like and charge them for sitting in if, if I feel like it. I can look at how it's made and make identical chairs and sell them, provided that the chair is not protected by a patent monopoly, but I think the invention of a chair is now older than 20 years. I can also look at it and start drawing things on it. I can change this chair in any way I like, and that is entirely normal, even typical, for property. Now let's compare this to what happens when I buy a DVD. The exact same background applies. I hold the receipt in hand here. This is a DVD made from a master copy at a plant somewhere. There are many ones like it, but this one is mine. However, I may not, with the DVD, I may not take it apart and use it for new projects. I may not look at how it's made and make identical copies, nor sell them. I may not show it out on the neighbor, show it out on the porch for neighbors to use and charge for it. When I buy a hard drive, hard drive, hard drive, same thing there. I have the receipt in hand. This hard drive is mine, and yet the copyright monopoly says that there are certain bit patterns. I may not write to this hard drive, despite it being my property. This is not normal for property. The copyright monopoly limits my rights to my own property. The copyright monopoly is a limitation on property rights. Now, it could be justified. The copyright monopoly could still be justified from many particular angles. But you cannot start by saying that property is good and therefore the copyright monopoly is good. You will end up in the exact opposite conclusion. And this has nothing to do with morals. The copyright monopoly was created on May 4, 1557 by Queen Mary, also known as Bloody Mary, in a censorship construction to kill political dissent in what was then England. Bloody Mary, known for 
burning about 300 Protestant families alive in an attempt to, to, cr to crush Protestantism. It wasn't very successful. She died the next year. The copyright monopoly still lives almost 500 years later. So why is this, why is this bad? Well, it gets worse. It gets much worse. Let's go back 40 years again. Well, if, well, let's look at the, how this threatens fundamental civil liberties. When we look at how we sent a letter in the mail 40 years ago, a physical letter, before SMTP, before POP3, there were certain things that happened with this mail, as you put it, in the mailbox. It had certain properties. First of all, it was secret. Nobody would open this letter, even if it, some letters could potentially contain copied drawings. Nobody would open all letters in transit just to make sure they didn't. The postal secret is kind of sacred, actually. It was anonymous. It is anonymous. When I put a letter in the mailbox, I and I alone determine whether I identify myself as sender on the outside of the envelope for the world to see, on the inside of the envelope, only in the letter, for only the recipient to know, or frankly, not at all. I have a right to send anonymous letters, and many of us do so all the time. We just write a recipient. It is untracked. Nobody keeps track of who's sending letters to whom, and nobody has the right or even the possibility of doing so. And we consider that a civil liberty. We consider that a fundamental right. And it is, or there is, a messenger immunity. The mailman is never, ever responsible for the, me for the contents of the sealed message. I said before that what we're demanding is a rocket science. Well... Here is what we're demanding. These are rights that our parents fought, bled, and died to get and to give to us. And I think it's absolutely reasonable that our children have the same rights as our fathers, grandfathers, mothers, and grandmothers fought and bled to give us in the environment that they live in. Regardless, entirely regardless of whether that means somebody cannot make money in the same way anymore. That does not factor into it. The job of an entrepreneur, the job of all entrepreneurs, is to make money given the current constraints of society in the terms of values and technology. They do not get to dismantle civil liberties, even if they can't make money otherwise. And here's the conflict. When you, say, when you tell the copyright industry that we are demanding that our children have the same rights that our parents fought and bled and died to give us, they go, but you can't do that. If you do that, we can't make any money. And I say, so what? We don't assign civil liberties after your profits. That's not how we work. That's not how politics work. If you can't make money in the face of sustained liberties, well, then you have to die. Your business have to go somewhere else. If you can't sell records in the face of sustained civil liberties, I couldn't care less. Go sell mayonnaise or bacon instead. So here's where the conflict is. And the copyright industry understands exactly that these four characteristics of a mail, of a letter, is 
what threatens their business. You can see them lobbying politicians all over the world to dismantle the messenger immunity. You see them attacking ISPs to try, try to make net, uh, net carriers responsible for the contents of what their users do, what, their, what citizens do. You see them attacking anonymity, trying to make everybody accountable. But that's not what free speech is about. Free speech has always been about the freedom to post an opinion and let the opinion speak for itself. Let it battle its own on its own merits. You see them attacking the postal secret. The copyright industry sued Aircom, Ireland's largest ISP, for the right to install switches, install wiretapping equipment in their core switches. A private industry is demanding the right to wiretap an entire population and censor an entire population when they say something that they don't like. That's why we can speak about copyright regime versus civil liberties. And that's why it's our duty as citizens of the world and of the net to reject these quite frankly outlandish outlandish demands. So, the Pirate Party exists in over 50 countries. What's my story? How did I go from a really ugly web page, and I shit you not, it was ugly, to having people in parliaments? I put two people in the European Parliament in 2009 when I led the Swedish Pirate Party. The German Piratenpartei has now put 50 people in its state parliaments. I expect the Dutch Piratenpartei to put, put a person or two in the Dutch parliament next month, actually, in their September elections. This is growing. We have people in local councils, almost 200 seats across Europe. And we're also starting to happily take, see, take hold here in Latin America with... with talented, dedicated, and passionate activists. You have activists from Partido Pirata do Brasil here, which is being founded just as we speak, actually, which I was very happy about. So, in 2005, three things happened. There was a fight about software, software patent monopolies in the European Parliament, which the activists just barely won. Knowledge was about to become illegal in Europe, and we just barely fought that back. There was yet another copyright monopoly harshening in Sweden, where everybody was discussing this. It was discussed over family dinners, at universities, over coffee at work, with, between friends, and yet politicians didn't notice. That kind of set me thinking. Because politicians are usually, usually the first people who notice if everybody's talking about a particular subject. They were completely blind to this. So, the, the copyright monopoly was harshened. And the final trigger was the Data Retention Directive in the European Union, which was enacted on December 14, 2005, turning all European mobile phones into governmental tracking devices. On December 16 of that, of that year, two days later, I registered the domain Pirat Party Edoresi, Pirate Party in Swedish, and put up this ugly web page based on these three pillars, essentially. Free knowledge, the right to privacy, and, and the right to share culture. And it just grew from there. I, well, post, I thought about what this come from this would come from. And I realized that people are people. Nobody was really being evil. Evil. There. Nobody was really being evil. They were doing their best, but from very limited knowledge. And there was no way to tell them that they had limited knowledge. Because they would just 
dismiss you out of hand like all the mails they get every day from somebody wanting a hamster tax to come to grips with carbon emissions or tearing down that bridge that was built in the 70s, which would never have been built anyway, right? So you needed to make it personal for them. You needed to make them aware that they even had a blind spot. So I put up that web page and announced it with just two lines in a chat channel, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 2006, January 1st. Hey, look, the Pirate Party has got its website up now after New Year's, www.piratepartiet.se. That's all the advertising I ever did. And the next day, that site got two million hits, sorry, three million hits. And I, when I came home from work on January 2nd, there were 300 activists waiting for me to be a part of this just holding out their hands, saying, give me something to do, I want to help build this. So that's when I realized that this was my chance to change the world for the better. I could go back to my job, a high-paying IT job as a middle manager, and just fade back into the background. But if I did that, my entire life would have been one big what if. What if I'd done that? What if I'd taken the plunge? What if I'd built that party? In reality, it wasn't a choice. In reality, I wouldn't have been able to see myself in the mirror if I hadn't done this. So, I took a huge bank loan and quit my job in that order, very important, and decided to change the world. So, this was in 2006, right? This happened in January 2006, and we were aiming for the September elections of 2006. So being used to changing the world in a weekend, on net time, this was eight months away. Like we had oceans of time. Turns out that politics doesn't quite work that way. The, <laughs> the time scales are completely different. But we still finished in the top ten. I was disappointed that we didn't get into Parliament on the first run. Turned out pretty much nobody had ever done that. So, this was a good result, but I didn't realize that until afterwards. I ran out of money. I mean, I took a huge loan. It was supposed to last me until the election. I ran out of money and realized that I, I couldn't really go back to having a day job at this time. So, I asked the activists if they wanted me to do this full time. And if so, please deposit a little bit of money to my account at the end of every month. Turns out enough people did that. So I lived off of begging, or for donations if you like, for 18 months. The press tried to scandalize me for that. Oh ho ho ho, he's living off of begging. Yes, I was. That's what passion does to you. That's one of the things you might need to go through if you want to change the world. But it's also very honest. People supported me for building this. And I think that's one of the most honest signs of appreciation you could possibly have. So I had enough to pay food and rent, pay my bills, and then came the EU elections, European Union elections. In 2009, three and a half years after founding, we succeeded. We broke through. We became the largest party for people under 30. Just drop kicking the establishment, getting 25% of the most coveted age group, those under 30. We became the largest party. And we did that on a budget of 50,000 euros. The other's budget was six million. We just drop kicked them. We just drop kicked them. So we put two people in the European Parliament, and that was kind of the break, kind of the breakthrough. Followed by successes pretty much all over Europe. I mean, German Piratenpartei is now getting into state parliament after state parliament. Like I said, I expect the Dutch Piratenpartei to succeed next month, and in pretty much every election. We're gaining just a little bit more foothold. Just as the value surveys of the 17-year-olds seven predicted. 
We are being described as the fastest growing political movement. And there's something to learn from this. There's something quite important to learn from this as a takeaway. I think it might be best expressed as a Futurama quote, really. There is a quote from Futurama saying, when push comes to shove, you got to do what you love, even if it's not a good idea. I mean, really, what kind of idiot thinks they can change the world by founding a political party and expecting it to spread to the entire world? Really? This kind of idiot. And <laughs> Thank you. And there's another lesson in there with another, with another good saying. If it's stupid but works, then it ain't stupid. So, a key lesson, key takeaway is that people are not evil. Your worst enemies are not evil. And Describing them as evil does not define them. Describing your enemies as evil does not define them. But it does something else. It defines you. And it, that does not help your cause. That will not help you change the world. Whether you believe that you can or cannot change the world. Whether you believe you can change the world or that you cannot change the world. I think you're right. This is all about attitude. All about attitude. I mean, I'm betting that everybody in this room and everybody watching this stream wants to change the world for the better in some way. You want to end illiteracy, teach two billion people to read. Well, you can do that. You can do that. You can make that happen. You want to give clean water to, to a continent. You can do that. You want to mine an asteroid. Why are you still sitting here? So this is all about attitude. And it's about leadership. Showing leadership. And that is much, much easier than most people realize before they, in a, pos before they are in a position of leadership. You're not, you don't become a leader because you're charismatic. It works the other way around. People see you as charismatic once they see you as the leader of something. Once they see you taking initiatives, you will be seen as charismatic. And taking initiatives, well, I think all of us know how to do that. It's a matter of saying, I'm going to change the world. Who's with me? And, we, I, and all of us can do that. Each and every one in this room wants to change the world for the better in some way. What we learn is that that is totally possible. There are th some things that you need to fulfill as a takeaway from this. Well, whatever, whatever we do, it needs to be credible, tangible, inclusive, and epic. Credible, inclusive, tangible, and epic. It needs to be credible. Whoever is looking at what you want to do needs to re look at it and realize that, yeah, we can do this. This can be done. I believe in this. It needs to be inclusive. Whoever is reading your manifesto, reading your ideas, need to immediately see how they can be a part of this. That's how you go from being one person 
to 10,000 fighting for the same goal. It needs to include people. It needs to be tangible. You can't just say, yeah, we're going to make it a better world and, yeah, free joints. It needs to be very specific about what, what you want to accomplish. Teach p two billion people to read. Okay, we just, we just taught one, people, one person to read. Excellent. Now there's just 1,999,999,999 left. That's being tangible. And it needs to be epic. You're never going to form a swarm around building the next financial bookkeeping system. You're not going to form a swarm around better sewer management. You need to hit the right level of epic. The right level of epic. For example, don't shoot for the moon. Don't shoot for the moon. We've already been there. Everybody knows that. Shoot for Mars. That's epic. Shooting for Mars, that's epic. Let's colonize a new planet. So what we learn is that we believe whatever, whatever your favorite change in the world is, when people start forming around you, you need to repeat this message. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. Inclusive. We. We can do this together. And as soon as you start becoming successful, somebody will start jumping up and down and saying, you're believing it wrong. Your project is great, but you're doing it completely wrong way. You should go backwards to Mars, not forwards. You should, get this, you should get clean water to this country before that one. You should be using this alphabet to help people learn to read. And that's a sign you're succeeding. Don't worry about these people. If they are so passionate about your goal, they're going to go about trying their own way of doing it. And that's a good thing. That's the way free software and open source works. If you, if you agree with the goal of a project but want to do it slightly differently, you fork it. Don't worry about the people who say you're believing it wrong. Everybody is empowered in a swarm to do whatever they think forwards the goal, forwards the purpose of the swarm. In this case, civil liberties for the next generation. Everything that you know about making and building open source or free software, everything you know about it in terms of leadership, in terms of building communities, in terms of getting thousands of volunteers for a project, everything you already know about that applies to politics too. And to going to Mars. And to teaching two billion people to read. You can do this already. You can do this. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This, what you already know is the key to making the change you want to see in the world. There's one key question I'd like you all to, to take home from this presentation. One key question that I'd like to see ringing in your ears as, as I leave this stage. Change in the world doesn't just happen. Change doesn't just happen. Somebody makes it happen. And the key question I want everybody here to hear ringing in their ears is, do you want to be that person? 
because there's absolutely nothing holding you back other than the false belief that you cannot. Do you want to be the person causing the change you want to see in the world? Thanks. Thank you all. I'm honored. I think we might have time for one or two questions if somebody has something on their mind. Ok. Pessoal, eu só queria avisar que o pessoal aqui do Partido Pirata, vem cá, tá certo? É, só para só avisar, só para vocês verem quem é, tá? O pessoal do Partido Pirata vai estar tá aqui na sequência, às 8 horas, ali no Bar Camp, tá certo? É, discutindo essas questões todas, tá? Então, quem quiser continuar essa discussão, pode partir aqui para o Bar Camp na sequência. Então, só fazer, repetir o chamado agora no Bar Camp, às 8 horas, a gente vai explicar sobre a convenção de fundação do Partido Pirata, que está rolando aqui em Recife. Amanhã é o grande ato de fundação, e os campuseiros estão aqui, podem ser fundadores do Partido Pirata do Brasil. Para saber mais, vamos no Bar Camp agora, às 8 horas, vamos se concentrar lá, que a gente vai estar explicando como é que funciona, certo? Para que te, quem está aqui na Campus Party poder ser o fundador. O Partido Pirata do Brasil é uma realidade e vai ser fundado amanhã. E nós queremos os campuseiros lá para ajudar nessa luta, como o Rick já bem chamou. Todo mundo amanhã, vamos fundar o Partido Pirata do Brasil. É, é, é. E, e vai ter ônibus, vai ter um ônibus amanhã, saindo amanhã às nove, nove e meia, daqui da Campus Party, em direção ao local da convenção. Eu vou estar aqui amanhã cedo, quem quiser só me procurar, a gente vai se concentrar ou, ou, ou ali perto da saída aqui dentro, ou lá embaixo, certo? Da onde vai sair o ônibus. Então vai ter um ônibus para quem quiser ir lá participar. Vai durar a partir da manhã até o começo da tarde, e o Rick também vai estar lá acompanhando junto com a gente. Então todos estão convidados a estarem indo participar e serem fundadores do Partido Pirata. Mas a gente vai explicar isso melhor no Bar Camp. Daqui uns 10, 15 minutos, pode se dirigir para lá. Assim que o pessoal acabar de distribuir as esfirras, a gente começa a, a, a palestra lá para explicar melhor, tá bom? Eu sou pirata e você? Vocês são piratas? É, só complementando, o, a convenção do Partido Pirata está acontecendo no Centro Social da Soledade, no bairro da Boa Vista, em Recife. Ok? Obrigado. Para o pessoal da imprensa, é, se você quiser participar da coletiva de imprensa com o Rick agora, na sala VIP, pessoal da imprensa, ok? Pessoal, muitíssimo obrigado. A gente vai dar continuidade aqui a todas as atividades da Campus Party, em todos os palcos. Né? Quem quiser acompanhar o Partido Pirata ali na, na, na área do Bar Camp, tá certo? É, quem pegou o aparelhinho da tradução, por favor, devolva agora, tá certo? Você pegou a parede da tradução, não esquece que você tem que devolver, então já passa lá, devolve agora, senão você acaba esquecendo e leva embora, tá certo? Muito obrigado, valeu.